illegal immigrants called dreamers. The president tweeted today, quote, the Democrats have been told and fully understand that there can be no DACA without the desperately needed wall at the southern border and an end to the horrible chain migration and ridiculous lottery systems of immigration, etc. We must protect our country at all costs. Can the president get the Democrats to yes, and will his own base accept amnesty? Let's discuss that with Fox News contributor Steve Cortez, a former Trump campaign operative and spokesman for the Hispanic 100, and Stephen Mulroy, a law professor at the University of Memphis and a former federal prosecutor. Happy New Year, gentlemen. Thank you uh, for, for, New Year. Uh, for joining us. This is going to be a contentious Thank issue uh, as we turn the, to, to the March 5th deadline that is out there on DACA. Professor, I want to start with you. You know, my concern is that Democrats, they like the issue. They just don't actually want to solve it. They always say, oh, we need comprehensive. We need to do all these things. The president's ask is pretty simple. Let's build a wall. It's something that Democrats have supported in the past. Is it unreasonable to think that we should protect our border and build a wall? Well, it's not unreasonable to think that we should protect our border but we don't necessarily need to build a wall in order to do that. I mean, the actual wall itself, if it were to, to cover the exact complete expanse of the border, would cost tens of billions of dollars and would probably not even be effective because what sections of wall we already have, experience has shown that you can tunnel under them or put ramps or uh, ladders over them. So if you're going to be spending tens of billions of dollars on a wall that actually won't work and will simply alienate relations with Mexico, why not use that money in a better way by increasing border security agents and uh, doing economic development in Mexico to reduce the uh, demand for illegal immigration, uh, increase guest worker programs. There are a lot more efficient, efficacious ways of tackling this problem that would not alienate Mexico, would actually work, and would be a better use of our tax dollars. Well, Steve Cortez, the, the president's going to get his, his wall, isn't he? He's going to get the $1.8 right. billion dollars that he wanted. And I don't know how he could settle for anything less. Uh, as President Obama said, elections have consequences, right? And this is one of the things the president promised he was going to do. They sure do. And, and Jason, this was a pillar of his electoral mandate. Uh, and I call him President Promise Keeper because what he did in 2017 is keep one promise after another. We are going to get that wall. And by the way, the wall is not just good for the United States. I would disagree with the professor. It's also actually good for Mexico uh, because it has a problem on its southern border, largely because of our porous southern border. So getting our border under control uh, between Texas and Arizona and California and Mexico is good policy, often uh, good. Good, good neighbors need good fences, and that's what we need between the U.S. and Mexico. But more importantly, I really want to give the president so much credit for what he's already done. Even before the big, beautiful wall goes up, illegal crossings have plunged under this president. Why? Because of clear-eyed rhetoric and better enforcement. Uh, and don't take my word for it, by the way. The director of ICE, Tom Homan, said that this president has done more for border security than the six previous presidents combined. So he is already enhancing our economic and national security by securing our borders. Now, Professor, you got to admit that the numbers are reflective on the, the reduction in the border crossing, but they're still happening. Uh, what do you attribute the, the lower uh, uh, crossing rate to, to be other than the election of Donald Trump? It's important to remember that actually immigration border crossings were actually on the decline for years prior to the election of Donald Trump. We actually now have a negative net outflow of immigration. There are more people leaving than coming in. And that was the case well before Donald Trump was elected. And as to whether he I gotta uh, needs tell you, to keep Professor, his promise, I, I got to tell you, I was the chairman of a committee in Congress and we held multiple hearings. I, I, I cannot, I don't, I would love to see those numbers where you think that we were actually on the decline with, with uh, President Obama. I mean, asylum seekers, others that were coming across this border were much higher than they are today. Well, I, you know, the source that I would use right now would be PolitiFact, which actually did a recent study a few months ago on this very thing. But as to the politics of it, let's also remember that President Trump had previously agreed with Chuck Schumer and Nancy Pelosi to give them DACA reform in exchange for beefed up border security without the wall. Why would it make sense for them to now negotiate against themselves and go backwards as part of the negotiations between the White House and Capitol Hill?
But Professor, you'd be okay if it's not necessarily a physical wall, but if it went to border security, I would probably personally disagree with you that economic development in northern Mexico is, I don't know why the Americans have to pay for that. But what else? Um, it, so you'd be okay, right, Professor, if it was not just a wall, but border security and the definition of that we might want to haggle about, correct? Right. Well, I think that actually increased border security and increased guest worker program would be a more efficient use of our tax uh, dollars than actually building a wall, which I think will be way more expensive than we expect because of the land rights that we would have to buy through eminent domain and the fact that it's not really very effective. So I so think Steve, it makes sense to talk about border security and DACA reform without the wall. So, Steve Cortez, what, what else is the president going to have to get? Because there is a long laundry right. list of lottery, asylum reform, there's DACA. Right. What, what else do you think is imperative? You've been close to Donald Trump. What do you think is imperative? No, Jason, and here's what I think is on the way, and here's what I've told the president personally. Uh, and I disagree with some of my colleagues on Team Trump, uh, people whom I respect. I do believe the DACA recipients, uh, and they're not dreamers, by the way. I don't call them dreamers. Americans have dreams, too, uh, and they're not kids. They are adults. But I believe DACA recipients are a different category of illegal immigrant, uh, those who truly did not choose to come here as, because they were brought here as children. So I believe they should be protected. Uh, and again, I disagree with a lot of people I respect on that issue. But having said that, and this is what I've told the president, I believe what he will do is we need things in return. And the big things are border security, more barricades, more resources for the border. But also, we can't just stop there and end to chain migration. Chain migration has been a disaster for the United <coughs> States. It affronts our national security. It affronts our economic security. Right now, and I'm the son of an immigrant and an Hispanic, the majority of immigrant-headed households in the United States receive some form of welfare. Uh, that's a tragedy. That's terrible policy. And it's nothing like our parents and grandparents and great grandparents faced when they came here when they wanted nothing from the United States other than an opportunity. So we're not well, doing immigration right, largely because of chain migration. That has to end. So we have to have a grand bargain, which I do believe is going to happen in, in January. DACA recipients protected, end of chain migration, resources at the border. Gentlemen, thank you. Happy New Year. I appreciate you joining us in this thank conversation. You. Earlier on Fox News, Happy Senator New Year. Lindsey Graham came on and said there was no possible way they were going to do DACA by itself, that that was just political theater. It'll be interesting to how, see how it plays out starting in January. Well, it's been a two-front war for President Trump this year, fighting not just the Democrats, but most of the media, too. But we'll tell you why he thinks he's going to win them over starting next year. That's next. Plus, we'll take a look at how this freezing weather across much of, much of the country may affect your holiday. Coming right up. This program is brought to you by ServPro, helping make fire and water damage like it never... New York Times, another reason that I'm going to win another four years is because newspapers, television, all forms of media will tank if I'm not there because without me, their ratings are going down the tubes. And for good measure, he added, without me, the New York Times will indeed not be the failing New York Times, but the failed New York Times. That's a pretty bold prediction, but could he be right? Fox News contributor and radio host Tammy Bruce is with us. Also joining us is political commentator Ben Kissel. Thank you both for being here. Uh, happy Hi, New guys. Year. Yeah, same uh, to ben, you. Let me, ben, let me start with you. T -t -t I worry that this DC bubble, the, the establishment media, and particularly the hard left, they just don't understand Donald Trump. They don't get him, they don't wanna get him, they don't wanna understand him, they just wanna throw as many barbs his way and they kind of actually play into his hand. But do you think the liberals and the media actually understand Donald Trump? Uh, well, I think the liberals in the media understand Donald Trump uh, just fine. There's a lot to correct when Donald Trump gives an interview. And in the interview that you're referencing with the New York Times, for example, he misquoted or got something wrong 24 times. This whole notion that the inter or that uh, that uh, media is against Donald Trump, the television news is against Donald Trump, is a total misnomer. It's a complete and utter lie. He got two billion dollars uh, worth of free media uh, from the uh, from uh, these uh, from the news outlets when he was running in 2016. This is just another example of Donald Trump wanting to raise up his own celebrity as opposed to raise up uh, lower income individuals in this country. He needs to focus on being the president, not being famous. Uh, it, Tammy, I, I've never heard President Trump say, you know, he's running to become famous. He was pretty much famous 
<laughs> when he started running. He yeah. um, but do you think the liberals and the left, do they really, do they get and understand President Trump, I mean, why he became President Trump? Uh, I don't think so. They don't even really understand themselves. Look, uh, just because you're stalking someone doesn't mean you love them. Right, uh, you've got uh, Trump derangement syndrome, uh, and this is about a focus and an obsession on the president because he was something that was unpredictable, that they c couldn't predict, and that they got wrong, and the end result they got wrong. So he it, it remains fascinating. But what I love about that tweet and what the president does is that look, he's he's got a very dry sense of humor, and he <laughs> is tr he's trolling them. Uh, this is fascinating because it also highlights the shift between last year and this year. Uh -huh. Last year, it was an attack. It was through the campaign and that there was a mission uh, to, to derail him as, as the uh, legacy media, as a propaganda arm for the Democrats. But now look at what's happened. Uh, his ratings, his approval rating on Thursday was uh, matching President Obama's at the no. same time in his first uh, uh, year. Uh, and you've, no. got, uh, you've got the media's approval rating pretty much at the level of where the cockroaches are. So when you think about who's won this fight, Jason, uh, it is the president. He's survived this year. He's, he's doing well. He's got major legislation going. We've got seven more years to go, and he's having a good time, uh -huh. and he's telling them that so, he's so not ben, going anywhere. He has, the, he has the lowest approval ratings of any president after one year since polling. Uh, so that's a total lie, uh, and uh, you and, can't and just let that have sit. always been accurate, haven't they, Ben? I mean, yeah. he's, come on. He's citing Donald one Trump. outsider poll. He cites one Rasmussen poll because it has the numbers I that cite he the one particularly that the cares about. Because the uh, election the ones that he was likes. a bit of a poll, right? This um, whole idea that Donald Trump is trolling the media is unnerving and disturbing, as it should be. We have North Korea. We have very significant situations happening globally. The last thing our president needs to do is act like that overweight Jason. person in his parents' basement, the Jason, same person that he said might have think, interrupted, uh, think, interacted with the Russians uh, 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 or interrupt the, uh, Jason, interrupted the campaign uh, let, let, in 2016. Jason, yeah, Let's give Tammy you, a chance here. Yes, Tammy, yeah, go I ahead. I think what you've just heard proves my point. And what we've got is an individual who clearly is governing and, and doing a very good job, and every now and then he might put out a tweet, and there is this volume of an emotional reaction that is outsized. Everything they accuse the president of no. doing is the, is the nature of the reaction to him. And it has worked to his benefit because the American people, when you see this, the American people realize that what he says about the media, what, what has finally been exposed about the media, is a level of unfairness, not just about being adversarial. We want an adversarial press, but now it's oppositional and it's deranged. And but this is what the Tim, American people the keeps most, them from being able to trust the media at this point. The most emotional people are diehard Trump supporters. I see it on my Twitter feed on a regular basis. I assure you uh, that it's not the snowflakes on not the left everything causing is Twitter, such dear. a kerfluffle. My dear, not everything uh, is Well, tell your president that then, because everything seems to be Twitter for him. See, for example, that, no, tweeting no, about Vanity no, Fair, let, tweeting let's about remember, Anna Wintour, how does me. that help us, uh, someone get a job? See, how does see, that help a lower income this family is, this reach the next It is working. Excuse me. And we, we, we filibustering here, it's a, this also does not uh, help the conversation. But we, we, because you see as everything is having come through Twitter or social media, uh, that's a you know pretty good example of projection. The fact is what everyone's what? missing and what liberals miss is the fact that governing is going on. The president is changing this country. He's changing the world. He's having a good time and he's doing a good <laughs> job of it. And I All think right. that you can let's you let, know people can let, laugh ben, and let, people let can have, filibuster, no, but we're he's doing, ben, we're going to let you job. have the last word. Ben, you get the last word. Go ahead. Uh, you know, this isn't a John Hughes film. Uh, you know, this isn't John Candy as president. I don't really care if my president's having a great time or not. He needs to govern. And he needs to help the people that he promised to help in this country. A lot of them voted for him, and a lot of them are wondering where is their reward for doing so. Uh, Tammy, Ben, thank you very much. I guess I, the last comment I make on that is I uh, would look at the numbers. Look at the end result. The economy's doing better. The stock right. market's up. Unemployment's doing better. And we're about to do a segment that I think will highlight that uh, people across the entire political spectrum are Wall benefiting. Wall Street doesn't reflect Main Street, but... Uh, well, in large part, it does at times. And we're going to have the next segment. Stay tuned for that. But you don't need a weatherman to tell you how cold it is across most of the country right now. But you do need one to warn you about how much worse it may get and the treacherous travels con travel conditions this holiday weekend. Let's get an update from Fox News Chief Meteorologist Rick Reichmuth in New York.
Jason, yeah, uh, obviously the cold has been here for a number of days already, and we have a lot of days to go till we are done with this. In fact, probably the better part of 10 to 12 more days before this cold air mass goes away. Keep in mind, we're still at the end of December, beginning of January, coldest time of the year, and uh, so it's still going to remain cold once it's gone. But this brutal cold hopefully will go away right now. Temperatures obviously really cold all the way towards the north. That cold air intrusion will continue to happen and it kind of happens behind these clipper systems that will continue to go through right now. We've got pretty significant snow. Some spots maybe four or five inches with this band of snow setting up across parts of Illinois, Indiana in towards Ohio. Uh, the ground is so cold, obviously all that snow will stick to the roads immediately causing really dangerous conditions across all the roadways. Erie, Pennsylvania, by the way, more snow on the way this weekend, probably about another 12 to 18 inches or so. Uh, you would like to not see any more of that. We also have really big rain coming into the Pacific Northwest, a higher elevation getting the snow, probably one to two feet here across the mountains of Idaho, Montana, and Wyoming. Good news, at least for one spot for skiing. Meanwhile, that clipper system is going to dive throughout the overnight hours here and across places from D.C. up towards Philadelphia, eventually exiting the coast. Not a major snowmaker, but because, again, the ground is so cold, it will stick very quickly, maybe one or two inches for some folks. But behind that, the colder air really settles in once again. So that sets us up for maybe close to history for New Year's Eve uh, in New York City, at least coldest ever, 100 years ago, one degree. We're not going to be anywhere near that, but the second coldest is 11 degrees, and we're going to be right around that amount, uh, that temperature around midnight. 12 degrees, uh, say maybe could be 10, 12, somewhere in there. Wind chill feeling like below zero, so certainly the cold air is in. Want to tell you, tomorrow, take a look at this. The high temperature, minus 18 in Fargo. That's the high actual air temperature. You get a little bit better Sunday, maybe in towards uh, minus 9. And here you go. Day one of the new year, 18 degrees in New York City, minus 1 in Fargo, 24 in Little Rock, 30 in Dallas. So the cold, obviously, here for a little bit of time. Jason? Rick, thank you. The president hasn't been just fending off attacks by mainstream media. He's also been struggling to get credit where it's due. Up next, we'll look at a big underreported story this year, some significant improvements in the lives of minority groups. Don't go away. The most talked about movie of the year has critics call Cora Ingram. Decades of liberal policies have done little for minorities living in America's major cities. By contrast, after just one year under President Trump, African-American unemployment has reached a 17-year low. The national unemployment rate for black Americans ages 16 and over fell to 7.3 percent. The overall crime rate in America's 30 largest cities, which disproportionately affects minority groups, fell by 2.7 percent. The murder rate in those cities declined by 5.6 percent. But will the left ever admit that President Trump may actually be helping minorities? Let's debate that with former Milwaukee County Sheriff David Clark, who's in Milwaukee tonight, and here in Washington, Attorney Monique Presley. Thank you both for being here. Uh, Happy New Year, uh, and I appreciate you joining us. Thank you. You have to admit, Monique, right, that the numbers under Donald Trump are actually trending in the right direction, that the economy is doing well, and that everybody on the full political spectrum is benefiting. The numbers, specifically the crime numbers, are doing well. They are trending well, as they have been for the past six years. And the unemployment numbers in the African-American community are continuing to trend well, as they have been for the past six years. When you mention numbers such as a 2.7 percent drop this year, well, there was a 2.8 percent drop last year. There was a 2.5 percent drop the year before that. So we've been seeing, actually, for about 80 for months now, a decrease in the unemployment numbers for African Americans. That's not really something that I can get. But that was unexpected that Donald Trump, you didn't think that Donald Trump was actually going to continue to move the numbers in the right direction and things would get better for minority groups. Uh, throughout the country. I can't actually name a single thing this president has done in order to move that forward. All I can give him credit for in that area is not messing it up. I'm hoping that the trend continues and that the numbers are even larger. But when you say it's 2.7 percent in a year, really you've got to look at, okay, but month by month it's been decreasing 0.2 percent for the past 84 months. Is that really something that this president there are There are a for? lot of things. Sheriff, let me bring you into this conversation. What have you seen that President Trump's doing that's actually helping the minority communities across the country? 
first of all, Jason, what I just heard is, is purely delusional. Everything is coming up roses in the President Trump economy. President Trump, when he looks out into the economy, he, he doesn't see ethnicity and color and gender. He sees the American worker, and he knows that they're looking for meaningful work. And so he has put forth uh, less regulation, lower taxes, which helps companies hire people when they turn those profits around. Under the Obama economy, compare and contrast, he had his boot on the neck of the American economy with his job-killing regulations, his high taxes. We were told under President Obama that a 16% black unemployment rate was the new normal. Now it's down to nearly 7%, almost below 7%, a 17-year low. That spans almost three administrations. So you can say what you want about uh, what Obama did to, to turn the economy around. But again, I'll remind you, we were told that was the new normal. Job losses, consumer confidence was down. And by the way, uh, black homeownership is up under Donald Trump, too. So Donald Trump, when he started out campaigning, he said to the black voters, hey, look, give me a chance. What do you have to lose? And now he's producing. So I, I see nothing but good for all Americans, but specifically in the black community, a 17-year low in the unemployment rate. So, Monique, the, the, the Congress just passed and the president's just signed a new tax bill. It's going to reduce the rates. Do you believe that's going to help in the minority communities or not help in the minority communities? No, I don't. And if you think about just Why? the tremendous amount of debt that we're going to have to shoulder. And Suddenly the Democrats all are all concerned get... about I the know. debt. Isn't it odd how everyone's changed Suddenly. positions? Suddenly the Republicans don't care how? about the debt how? and are adding to it and bringing up infrastructure bills and are all excited about them. I'm kind of wondering if the GOP has an identity but crisis. How? No. But I that was supposed to be the new normal. I don't know who he was talking to. Merry Christmas, by the way, Sheriff Clark. But the point is, it hasn't been that high for five years. Okay, and it wait, has wait. been going I wanna go, down I want to go back to actually what I, what I asked you about, which is allowing the minority communities and all Americans to keep more money in their own wallets. That's a good thing, isn't it? Yes, it is. Okay, so why all the opposition to the tax plan when it will lower the rate at which they're having to pay their taxes. Well, I think you know that it's not about the fact that I get to keep $50 in my pocket. It's more than 50 It's bucks. that the nth percentile in the United States get to, gets to keep millions more in their pockets and that the corporations are the biggest winners of all. You know, it's not sure, whether sure. somebody gets to keep a dollar. It's that when, when a person who doesn't have any money just gets to keep $3 while people who have plenty of it get to keep 30 million the disparities are pretty clear uh, and that's what people are having a problem million dollar with. example but sheriff what's your take on this tax plan and what it's going to do in minority communities well of course it's going to help you know more blacks have moved into the the middle class some have even moved into the upper middle class and that's who this uh, uh, tax cut is going to benefit look when people can keep more of their own money they can maybe get their kids and the black community out of these failing k-12 urban uh, schools and get them into private schools. They've got to dig a little deeper into their pocket to be able to do that sort of thing. So as long as all Americans get to keep more of their money, we know how to spend our money better than the federal government does. So I just think that that's a good thing. Well, thank you. And thanks, Monique. Uh, Sheriff, I've got one more issue I want to uh, talk to you about uh, before we say goodbye to you. I want to get your reaction about a report out tonight over an alleged incident between you and a passenger on a flight to Milwaukee. This took place almost a year ago. The Milwaukee Journal Sentinel is reporting the FBI got involved. And there is this document that uh, I've, I've actually read exonerating you from the uh, Department of Justice. Uh, but while there are no charges, the passenger has filed a civil lawsuit against you. I would like to get your take on it. Well, it's a frivolous lawsuit, and it has yet to be adjudicated, so I can't say too much. But this is a fake news story. I don't know how Donald Trump feels to be the subject of fake news from the liberal media. As you indicated, I sent you the letter. They found no wrongdoing. That case is closed. And uh, I was informed of that last May. So here we are in December, and they're trying to uh, redig this story, rehash it with uh, a lies uh, inter interwoven in between it to make it seem like this is something new. There was no wrongdoing. I was doing good police work at the time, and I think the uh, United States Attorney's Office recognized that, and that's why they said there was no evidence of any wrongdoing. This Sheriff, I, 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 nothing burger. Sheriff, I appreciate you being here, to Monique as well. We wish you both a happy, happy new year. 
Coming up next, a ruling in, in Oregon is putting the issue of gay rights versus religious liberties back in the headlines. We'll tell you about who won this round and why in just a minute. It's one of the most difficult legal issues of our times. How to protect both newly established gay rights and our long-standing religious liberties when they come into conflict. The Oregon Court of Appeals ruled yesterday against a couple who were fined $135,000 after their bakery declined to make a wedding cake for lesbian partners. The attorney for, the, for bakers, Melissa and Aaron Klein, said his clients were deprived of the Constitution's promises of religious liberty and free speech. How do we find that balance in these thorny issues when everybody's rights want to be respected? Joining us now for this discussion from Austin, Texas, is Robert Henneke, the General Counsel and Director for the Center for the American Future, along with Robin Biro, an LGBTQ activist and an Army Ranger veteran who is in Atlanta. First, uh, Robin, I want to thank you for your, uh, your service to our country and protecting the, protecting the United States and your service in our military. I really do, really do appreciate that. But I want to start with uh, Robert here. Um, why is this a religious liberty? First Amendment issue, as opposed to what what Robin's going to argue, which is something a bit different than that. Why why does well, religious liberty and the First Amendment trump what is going on here? Jason, thank you for having me on the program. The central issue in this case is whether the judiciary should decide what constitutes artistic expression. Legally, it's uncharted territory for courts to say what is art and what is not. And here, the Oregon Appellate Court got it wrong when they decided that the artistry expressed by Mrs. Klein in her custom handcrafted cakes was not entitled to the same type of First Amendment protection that's afforded to other mediums of artistry and artistic expression. Now they did have an Oregon state law that they were looking to, right? But the issue that they're going to be arguing and wanting to appeal is going to be based on the First Amendment issue, correct? Well, the way they got around that was in going into the public doctrine that looks at ordinary businesses engaged in commerce as brick and mortar type operations that fall outside of typical First Amendment uh, freedom of expression and religious freedom protections. But the court did that to get to the end result that it wanted to accomplish. And in doing so, it ignored the fact that Mrs. Klein's business was not just an ordinary bakery. It was a service and artistic expression that she did using her hands in creating these type of cakes, which was the way that she expressed herself. And the Constitution is clear that the First Amendment protects that type of artistic expression, which unfortunately the Oregon court failed to recognize and got wrong here. Now, Robin, as you look at this case, how do you, how do you see it? Because my guess is you have got a little different take on this. I do, and thank you for having me on. I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, I want to make one point clear. The reason that the fine was $135,000 was because these bakers doxed the individuals who were declined service. They put their personal information out, attacked their children, turned them into CPS, uh, and for, they vilified them. This has nothing to do with artistic expression. They flat out denied them service. That's discrimination. That is not an American value. And I frankly, I would like to point out that I really really see this as an identity politic issue on the on the side of the right LGBT Americans just want to be treated like everybody else. The golden rule, I, don't, I do not want to be turned away and discriminated against. This is not about cakes. This is just wanting to be treated the same as everyone else. We would frankly like to stop this identity politic issue of being singled out. I happen to be a gay army ranger. My ranger buddies never treated me any different than any of my peers. As long as I shot fine and held my ranger standards, nobody cared. Now, do you believe, Robert, though, that, or Robin, I should say, do you believe there's any room for religious liberty? I mean, if this really truly is a, a longstanding true belief in their religious liberty, why can't they make this decision? 
There, that's a great question. I'm glad you posed it. There's a case in Colorado where, where a uh, customer wanted to make a cake in the shape of a Bible that said homosexuality is a sin. And in that case, that was a, a First Amendment issue. But the baker sold them the cake, sold them the bag of icing and said they could write whatever they wanted to on it. So in that case, it didn't violate any laws. They didn't discriminate against against the person's religious liberties. Uh, so that, that's where the line is. This is about discrimination, though. These people were flat out told that they were not going to be served because they were gay. And I understand the argument that why give a, a homophobic baker your money? But the issue is it comes down to discrimination. And that's just not, like I said, it's not an American in value. It's not OK. We are all just Americans. Please, let's move I past identity politics. No one cares that I'm gay. And this religious baker has no right to force her religious beliefs on me. Robert, uh, in a what, public where, business. Robert, where is the line with religious liberty and this case is ultimately going to be decided by the Supreme Court because there is a different case that is pending before the court, correct? Well, that's right. And this Oregon case, the Klein case, will you know, end up being a, a footnote of little consequence given that the United States Supreme Court is currently considering the Masterpiece Cake Shop case. And in the recent oral arguments before the U.S. Supreme Court, the justices, uh, specifically Justice Kennedy and Justice Roberts, were talking about where this tension exists uh, in the tug and war between the two sides and, and how they're grappling with that issue. Unfortunately, the Oregon Appellate Court avoided that issue and instead uh, shoehorned uh, Mrs. Klein's artistry into just rather the, the public doctrine in, for, in terms of a brick and mortar business. The real discrimination here is in not recognizing that the masterpieces that she created with her hands were her form of expression and that she's entitled to First Amendment protection for that artistry, especially right. insofar as that it's an expression of, of her also genuine, deeply held religious beliefs. Robin, I'll give you the last word quickly. We've got just a few seconds. Last word, like I said, just please treat us the same as anyone else. Live by the golden rule. Treat us the way that you yourself want to be treated. Please, discrimination is never okay. And that's what I see this as. Gentlemen, thank you both. Happy New Year. Coming up, we'll tell you how one of President Trump's problems with North Korea just became twice as bad. How a U.S. spy satellite photos apparently show Chinese ships transferring oil to North Korean ships at sea. Now, two senior European security sources tell Reuters that the Russians have been doing the same thing. Let's discuss what this means with Fox News contributor and political science professor Chiron Skinner in San Francisco. Professor, thank you so much for, for joining us. Uh, this is a very difficult situation. I mean, on one hand, you had a very impressive vote in the United Nations, only now to have evidence that both Russia and China are violating these same sanctions. What so would you recommend to the president? Um, what's actually happening here is that um, global leadership is being devolved to the United States. And um, because the Russians and Chinese are not living up to United Nations Security Council res resolutions, especially the one in September, um, they're violating international law and international norms. And I would suggest that the president of the United States make it absolutely clear that if the, if the governments in Russia and China do not penalize and stop those shipping companies that are trading oil um, with the North Koreans, um, that the United States has to begin to look at military options um, and that um, underscore the fact that the United States is actually going to become um, the leader um, of resolving the North Korean conflict within Northeast Asia and beyond. And that's not something I think the Russians and the Chinese want to happen. Now, to add the clarity that you're seeking, a military option against China and Russia is probably not viable, but they can do some things, for instance, such as a naval blockade. Is that what you mean by saying taking action and military action? Um, I'm not really suggesting military action because I know that the Secretary of State and the Secretary of Defense do not want to go down that path. They've been working overtime on the diplomatic front, but we have to let um, our strategic adversaries in the North Korea issue understand that the full range of options have to be on the table. We will continue to use dipl diplomacy aggressively, but they have to know that if they make North Korea much more of an unstable regime by propping it up. 
it serves no good interest for them as well. I don't now think the they quite understand it yet. Now, the president has tried to channel Ronald Reagan in his whole peace through strength uh, approach. Um, is the United Nations as worthless as it seems from at least my vantage point? Um, I wouldn't say it's worthless. It is a huge debating society where often the in the General Assembly, Assembly the United States is the target. Um, but the fact that we got unanimous votes in the United Nations suggests that the international community is moving in the direction of what the United States has been saying all along, especially under President Trump, that North Korea has to be a denuclearized country um, because it is so particularly dangerous. Um, it could be the site of um, nuclear proliferation throughout um, Northeast Asia, indeed the Indo-Pacific region. And so I think what it can do for the United States now um, under the America First policy of the president is help re reinforce um, the issues that America First and principled realism, a pillar, pillar of the president's policy, um, suggests is that sovereignty matters, that respecting international norms and laws, they matter as well. And so in that way, the UN does play a useful role. My own personal take on this is that more sanctions isn't going to work because the leader of North Korea really doesn't care about his people. But uh, last question for you real quick. The idea of a naval blockade to prohibit the importation of things that are needed and critical in North Korea, do you believe that is one of the viable things sitting on the president's desk? I think it's being debated um, in the Pentagon and in the national security community. Whether it's on the president's desk, I don't know. But let me just speak to um, um, your pessimism on UN Security Council resolutions. They do work when there is compliance. And if the, given the strict nature of the most recent December um, 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 resolution against North Korea and the Security Council, if indeed it's implemented fully, um, it has a punishing impact on the North Korean economy. The um, Russians and Chinese, if they don't comply, they are undermining something that could really bring North Korea to the negotiating table. Well, and I do. I, I hope that President Trump continues to show the world how the Russians and the Chinese evidently are not complying with something that they were supportive of not too long ago. Professor, we wish you the happiest of holidays and a happy new year. And thank you again for joining us. A left-wing web, uh, left website publishes a list of things it says white people need to stop ruining. How do you think that's going over? Stay with us. Backlash at BuzzFeed has been fierce after the website published a piece called, quote, 37 things white people need to stop ruining in 2018. At least it seems to be an attempt at humor. Judging by the number one complaint on the list, white people are ruining macaroni and cheese. I don't even know how that's possible. But some observations were decidedly not meant to be funny, such as a majority of white Americans voting for President Trump. Let's try to figure out what's going, here, going on here with comedian Jimmy Fela, who's also the head writer for Kennedy on the Fox Business Network. Jimmy, thanks for joining us. Happy New Year. Great to see oh. you. Let's get him. Yeah, well, what, what, what's, uh, what's your take on the, what BuzzFeed tried to do? Wow, I mean, this is a garbage piece. But let's not overlook the important pieces of journalism BuzzFeed has given us this year, like 13 pieces of cheese that look like cats and which member of the royal family would throw the best Super Bowl party, you know? But yeah, it's, it's total junk in the sense that we all know that if a white person were to write this, not only would they get fired instantaneously, but anyone who didn't denounce them strongly enough. Like, do you know what would happen to Taylor Swift if a white person wrote this and she didn't denounce them within 30 seconds of writing it? It's kind of disgusting, you know, that that double standard exists. But it also exposes, Jason, which is one of the things I find fascinating, it exposes this myth that the left actually cares about race relations because they only do when there's a way to weaponize it for their political gain. Meaning if they really cared, if they really treated black people as equals, to give you an example, they would want to hold this woman to the same standard they hold white people to. But on the left, they don't do that. They infantilize black people and they say like, oh, we can't criticize them because they're a member of a protected class. We can't fire this girl because she doesn't know any better. She can't help herself because she's black. 
And that's the one thing I find most insulted. Like, I would be insulted by the reaction to this piece if I was black because you're not being treated as an equal. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, you know, when they start to go into this territory, it, it just makes me cringe. I, I yeah. really try to do all I can to just turn it off. You know, one, <laughs> one other thing that, that came out here is, uh, I didn't know if you knew this, but yeah. evidently farmers markets. A pair of San Diego State University geography professors claim mm -hmm. in a new, bo a new book, farmers markets are yeah. often white spaces <laughs> where the food consumption habits of white people are normalized. Now. These people are being paid with taxpayer dollars, yes. and this is what they're researching? This is, I mean, you could file this under, like, reason 2,581,000 why Trump won. When everything is racist, nothing is racist anymore. You know what I mean? If you just tell everybody that everything that happens, like, we, we keep saying we need to have this conversation about race in this country, but I think we need to start by defining what race is. Because in this instance, these people were given money to figure out the best way to feed low-income people. But instead, they got an opus about racism, which really isn't a very good dinner. You know, it doesn't I mean, really work. I, it doesn't like work I, out that way. And I know as a I, white person, I've ruined macaroni and cheese, according to BuzzFeed, which was probably the one thing, Jason, that I resented the most, because I'm like 94% body fat. If there's anything I know about, if I have one generous. area that's of, yeah, generous, it's mac and actually. cheese. Let's be fair. <laughs> well, uh, look, and finally, I want to talk about CNN went on a two day quest oh, man. to blow the lid off a major conspiracy. <laughs> Why was a truck blocking their camera's view of President Trump's golf course in West Palm Beach? The <laughs> yeah, white box truck became the network's greatest white whale as CNN would just not let go of this story. I, I'm sure you saw it. Today, yeah, is... a big wa a white box truck parked in front of those hedges trying to obscure our shot of President Trump golfing. This is just so great. And we're trying to figure out where this white truck comes from. I should say, for the record, our Noah Gray has been on the case. Did you see the driver there, Sarah, like blocking his face? Did you see that? 